So my name's Matt. I'm, I'm one of the leaders here at Hope City. It's my privilege to teach this morning. And uh, we're looking at, at uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's telling of the life story of Jesus. And before we get into that, many of you might know the story of a man called Paul or Saul, the same guy with Roman and Jewish names. Now, he went from being probably the most passionate, probably the most active enemy of the church to one of its greatest drivers in one pivotal moment on some road to Damascus back in the earliest years of the church. Now, God, in his wisdom, rather than bringing judgment on that great enemy of the church, one who surely deserved it, instead, I mean, he was doing terrible things. Instead, God withheld it. And rather than just striking him down one afternoon, deciding, that's it, enough is enough, which he surely could have done, and he he did that to others. Instead, God spoke into Saul's life. His life was turned around and transformed. His heart was transformed. God was patient, we might say, but, but he was right to be so. So I was thinking about this. If you turn the clock back, one week from that dramatic moment on the Damascus Road, or, or one month from that moment of transformation, think about the people that Saul hurt as he went from house to house destroying the church. As we're told, innocent thrown into prison, families torn apart. Some people were even killed. God's patience has a price. God's patience has a price, but that's not just true for Saul and his ancient story. If you're a follower of Jesus here today, it's true in your story too. Now, maybe you didn't send anyone to their death. I I don't imagine you did, but wrongs you have done will almost certainly have impacted others. It's definitely true for me. I know I've thought things, I've said things, I've done things that have hurt others, sometimes gravely, lasting damage. Now, I am repentant about that, for sure. I'm sorry for where I've gone wrong, for who I was. I've agreed with God that my way was not the right way, that I was going the wrong way, and that his way is the right way. I'm looking to Jesus for forgiveness for what I've done. I'm choosing to turn his way day by day, choosing repentance again and again because I still stumble and fall. But God was patient with me. Uh, He held out his gracious hand towards me over years. But that patience had a price for those around me. Maybe, Maybe you wouldn't call yourself a Christian here today. Then I want to tell you that God is being patient with you. Right now, you are not living his way. You're not bowing the knee to him as Lord. You're not living the righteous life the Lord calls us to. And again, maybe maybe you're not sending people to their death. But I think I can say with solid confidence, even if you are really rather nice, you will have hurt other people. That's the way life is. Now, perhaps not gravely, perhaps not yet at least, or not that you know, or not that you meant to. But God in his righteousness could justly call time on you right now. Like when the bell rings at the end of an exam, he could take your paper, mark your life, show you where you messed up, and then fail you big time on the spot. And it's not like you have to get a C or above to get in to make the grade. God's standard is perfection, and that's that's something we're just not. We fall short of that. God is being patient with you right now. He is waiting for you. He's holding out his hand to you, even today offering you his mercy, but that, that patience while he waits, that, that, that has a price. Now, why begin with this? Well, we're working our way through Jesus's famous Sermon on the Mount, and this idea that patience has a price, I think, is key to the passage we're tackling this week. We've been thinking about this whole section of Jesus's teaching as Jesus's blueprint for his kingdom of transformed hearts. It's the design for his good and perfect kingdom which is beginning to emerge in the midst of our broken world as Jesus transforms hearts. Now, last week, Ewan helped us think through the what and the why of turning the other cheek, of not taking revenge. If you thought turn the other cheek was challenging, well, Jesus turns the dial all the way to 11 this week. There's a, there's a big step up. Last week, you have a passive Do not resist an evil person, Matthew 5.39. This week we get the active, love your enemies. So we're going to read together before we have some time to think and talk about it. We're in Matthew's gospel, 
and it's his biography of Jesus, the end of chapter 5. It's page 970 in the Blue Church Bibles. And then if you look for the big six and just go upwards a little bit above it, you will find verse 43, a tiny 43. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, and Zoe is way ahead of me, <laughs> ready a hundred times to read for us this morning. Thank you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thank you, Dave. Like I said, Jesus finishes this section of his blueprint for the kingdom of transformed hearts by turning the dial all the way up to 11. He's been speaking to his people about how their righteousness needs to surpass the best of the best of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. He's showing them how what's needed is like an inside-out righteousness, showing them it gets to the heart of how God wants us to live, rather than just an outside-in righteousness that's about performance about ticking some boxes. And we've seen the only way this in time out righteousness comes is from a transformed heart. So when we see it coming, we're not earning a place in God's kingdom. It's just evidence we already have a place. It's like green shoots kind of sprouting up from under the ground. The transformed heart, Jesus has planted down there doing its work. Now, there is a lot which could be said about today's passage. We're not going to cover everything this morning. A lot has been said about it. I want to focus on just three insights this morning, just three things that I think are key to getting our heads around the heart of what Jesus is saying to us. And the first one is this blueprint that he's giving us, this blueprint he's showing us, the blueprint is for children of God. The blueprint is for children of God. Look down at verse 45. Why does Jesus explain this heart of God's law? Why does he call his followers into this radical next level obedience, this impossible sounding inside out obedience, that you may be children of your father in heaven? That's his, that's his goal. That's his purpose. That's the point of behaving in these ways. But what does it mean to be children of your father in heaven? Now, it's not about biological descent. We're all adopted into God's family. So what is it about? It's definitely about a kind of precious and a distinctive relationship with God. Being children means God is our Father, right? He relates to us with every perfection of what it means and what it could mean to be a father. Loving, caring, disciplining, training, protecting, providing. Now, it's definitely about that. Being children of the Father means that, but it also means there is a family likeness. Or we're characterized by our father. Now, perhaps you see this a little bit in earth families. In earthly families, do sporty dads rub off into sporty children? What do you think? That happens sometimes? Yeah, maybe, maybe just a little bit. Our attitudes, our defaults, shaped by our parents. Some of mine definitely were. Do we share genetic makeup sometimes? Meaning there is some real likeness, maybe a nose. You know, have their father's nose. Or does the fact that I had long hair when I was younger have any relationship to the very long hair of my boys? <laughs> there is a measure of likeness in family, likeness in biology, likeness in character, likeness in values, likeness in behavior, outlook, attitudes. And when Jesus speaks about us being children and God our Father here, he's also speaking about family likeness. God's children increasingly share his character his values, his attitudes. Now, we're not the finished product, sure, but as we begin to live out this kingdom blueprint, we will more and more be or become children of God in, in that we more and more reflect his character, his values, 
his attitude. So there's, there's the first insight for you. This kingdom blueprint is a kingdom for children of God, his family who increasingly share the family likeness. Why, why is that important? It was, as we try and get our heads around Jesus' command to love our enemies, we have to understand that is part of this family likeness as well. It's part of what flows out of the character, the attitude of God. And that's exactly the point Jesus makes. God loves all. Same verse, verse 45. Sun for the evil and the good. Rain for the righteous and the unrighteous. And notice, by the way, that God causes the sun to rise. Jesus claims here. It's not just clockwork. Sure, it obeys the laws of physics, but who wrote those laws? And notice also it's his sun. See that too? His sun rises. It belongs to him. It rises on all people at his command. He, he sends the rain. You see how actively that's described? God is doing it. It's not passively happening. And as he commands us to love actively, that's just matching how God loves actively. Going beyond just turning the other cheek passively, sharing in the family likeness is loving actively. But there's more to the family likeness than simply loving universally, simply loving evil and good, righteous and unrighteous alike. And that brings me on to my second insight. God loves all, but God loves all in patient hope. This love, his ongoing loving acts towards all, righteous and unrighteous, good and evil, don't mean he's ignoring the evil. They don't mean he's ignoring the unrighteousness. They don't mean he's inviting it to continue indefinitely, passively accepting it just as part of life. This is just what life is. God is endlessly clear with us in his Bible that there will be a reckoning. 100% of people die, and after death comes judgment, God tells us. God calls each one to account for their life, for their deeds. I could quote one of any of 100 passages, but here's Psalm 1. Nice, easy psalm to find because it's the first one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. Blessings for the righteous. That person's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Blessings for the righteous, not so the wicked. They're like chaff the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now, that's just one place I showed you that from. I could show you that from a hundred places in the Bible. This is a common place, repeated time and time again. Jesus is going to finish this section of teaching with a famous parable, a house built on a rock or a house built on sand. And he describes in that parable a coming flood that is judgment, And he tells us there is destruction coming for those who do wrong. There will be a reckoning. Now, Ewan showed us last week that turning the other cheek, well, the justice of God stands behind Jesus' call to turn the other cheek. It is God's to repay. He will avenge. We can turn the other cheek because we're entrusting judgment to him on the last day. I think it's the patient mercy of God which stands under Jesus' call to go further still and even love our enemies. God is patient. He's holding back judgment, wanting all to come to salvation. In his goodness, he continues to actively send sun, actively send rain in the meantime, holding out his hands towards us in invitation, creating time for us to respond. Peter, one of Jesus' first followers, writes about exactly this in 2 Peter 3. By the same word, the present heaven and earth is reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment. There it is again, a day of judgment coming and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I think that's the only explanation, really, for how a God of righteousness and justice can actively cause his son to rise on evil and good. Actively send uh, rain on unrighteous and righteous. 
in that ancient farming-based society, everybody knew where their food came from. Nobody thought sausages grew in Tesco. Sun and rain are the crucial providences from God that feed anyone, right? They're where everything comes from. For there to be food tomorrow, for life to continue, you need sun and you need rain. It's like a dead man switch. Have you seen those? I have them on trains, so the train stops if the driver dies. Like a dead man switch. If God takes his foot off, well, it all stops. The show is over. And yet, instead of calling time, gathering the righteous to him, judging the wicked, in his wisdom and mercy, God actively loves and patiently waits. What's this got to do with today's passage? Children of God, children who share the family likeness, should rightly emulate him. We should actively love, even even those who do wrong, even, even our enemies, even our persecutors, Amen. in patient hope that they might be saved. Because those are the only two ways this ends, salvation or judgment. And I guess that brings me to my third point. Patience has a price. Now, this patience as we actively love our enemies even those who persecute us. This has a price. It has a price for those who are wronged and hurt. Now, sometimes that's us. Sometimes, perhaps it's harder. It's others who are going to pay. What does this look like in practice? What does it really look like to turn the other cheek? More than that, to love your enemies. More than that, to pray for those who persecute you. Well, of course, we can look to Jesus, to the cross. This patient love that runs in the family of God has a price even for God. We see that most plainly at the cross. Jesus' enemies hated him so much that they orchestrated his shaming, his torture, even his death, the most awful death the world of his day had to offer. It's no tragic misunderstanding. It's no accident that happened there. It was a carefully laid plan by ruthless enemies who would stop at nothing. So why does Jesus walk right into it, led by the Spirit? Why does he let it happen, not call legions of angels to his side and stand and fight? He loves his enemies. Now, it's going to cost him, cost him dear. This patience has a price, but still, he loves his enemies. He prays for those who persecute him. He walks the path of the kingdom. The path of obedience all the way to the end. Now, now I would have called time. Judgment now, this has gone far enough. Mercy is exhausted. My patience, exhausted. Time is up, but Jesus goes all the way. He walks the path of the kingdom all the way to the end in love, in hope for his enemies. See, in love, Jesus weeps over the same Jews who are going to plot his death on the way into Jerusalem. In, in hope, he prays, Father, forgive them for the very same soldiers who had driven nails through his hands. And then he pays the price and dies. God knows firsthand that patience has a price, that loving enemies in hope has a price. So here's the thing. It's a price he deems worth paying for his enemies, and of course for us. Romans 5, 10. Well, we were God's enemies. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. We, too, were his enemies. What doesn't give us this costly command to love our enemies, pray for our persecutors in the abstract? This is something that runs in the family. And... Jesus gives this costly command to us, to people who've already experienced the blessing of this from the other side, as his enemies. So there are my three insights for you. Okay, The kingdom blueprint we've been talking about is a blueprint for children of God, for children who increasingly share the, the Father's likeness. God loves all. Yeah, God loves all in patient hope. He is not ignoring evil. He's not overlooking unrighteousness. And and that patience has a price. But it's a price that God in love thinks is worth paying. So what what do we do with this? What does this mean for you and me? 
Well, first of all, I would say, if you've never done it yet, grasp God's mercy. If you've never done it yet, grasp God's mercy. See the love he's extending to you now. Recognize that that is his patience that is extending love towards you in hope. He's not ignorant of where you've fallen. You haven't got away with it, successfully hidden it under the rug. He's patient. He's patient with a purchase, a purpose. He wants your salvation. He's reaching out to you. Even now, as I'm speaking, he is reaching out to you. And there's a line. There's a limit. There's an end date coming, a best before date coming, a day where this door of hope will be closed, leaving you only as God's enemy, no longer as the subject of his patient love, only judgment ahead. So grasp God's mercy today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a short prayer you can use to do that right now. Just a moment to read it through and decide if you want to make it own, your own. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray this. And if this is yours as well, you can pray along with me inside your head if you're ready to grasp God's mercy today. I don't want to let this opportunity, this moment go by without creating this space. So pray along with me if you're ready in your head. God, I was going the wrong way. I'm sorry. I want to go the right way. Thank you that Jesus did everything right yet took the punishment for all my wrong when he died on the cross. Thank you that Jesus rose into new life, and I can share that new life because of him. I want to follow you now, so as best as I know how, I give you my life. Amen. Did you pray that prayer? If you prayed that prayer, please let someone know, because you've joined a new family. We would like to be your family. We'd like to welcome you in. We'd like to help you take first steps in this new life. So speak to a Christian friend. If you don't know someone to speak to, speak to me. I'd be glad to meet. If you're online, there's a button you can click to connect with us too. Grasp God's mercy today. And what if you have grasped that mercy, right? What if you have joined this family through God's grace? Well, I haven't touched yet on verse 48. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus closes this whole section. I think this, little, this last verse is the, is the kicker at the end of the whole section on, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. You thought it was that hard, it's even harder. He closes that whole section on the heart of the law, the true way of the king, with something that simply sounds impossible. Be perfect, he says. After showing us just how far up perfection is, what that would mean, peacemaking, pure from the heart, merciful to the max. Is Jesus setting an impossible standard here at the end of this little chapter? Is the whole thing just a crushing list of impossible demands? Well, it's actually hard to read it that way. Like Jesus expects and demands 10 out of 10 all the way because he's just about to teach his followers to pray and to keep on praying, forgive us our debts, forgive us our sins. Well, 10 out of 10s don't have debts. They don't have sins. So if you were perfect, surely you wouldn't need to pray a prayer like that, and yet Jesus teaches you to. So I'm not quite sure that that is what it could mean. But at the other extreme, right, one way you can read this is you can go, oh, of course I can't do that. I'm not perfect. I guess I just need more mercy and grace. More mercy and grace for me. Jesus guards against wallowing at that, it's impossible, I don't need to do anything, end of the spectrum too. He tells us clearly again and again in this section where he's given us all these things, he expects us to put these words into practice. The parable he closes out with puts it this way, Matthew 7, 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. If you thought these words were just like impossible standard that I'm never going to reach and I don't have to bother trying, like that's not what Jesus is saying here. So what, what does he mean when he says be perfect? If it can't be 100%, 10 out of 10, and it can't be just an impossible standard that we're never going to get to. Well, the word perfect does have that 10 out of 10 sense, the highest standard. But the original Greek word also has a sense of being mature, full grown, complete, fully developed. That is what I think he's getting at. Remember how loving your, fa your enemy 
It's taken on the family likeness. But he says, grow up. Grow up into the family likeness. Being perfect or mature, full grown, is about us growing into that family, taking on the family resemblance. It's about the way of the king, which was impossible, above and beyond us all, becoming second nature, we might say, or really becoming first nature, becoming our own nature. Now, it's not what makes you part of the family. We talked about that repeatedly as we think about Jesus's blueprint for the kingdom of transformed hearts. Following the blueprint isn't what earns you your place in God's people, what earns your place in the family. What the blueprint does instead is it gives you evidence that you see that you are part of that family. Evidence that develops over time, right? It doesn't all come at once. It grows up like little shoots, tiny things to see to begin with, but shows you the seed is planted, the heart is transformed, the work has begun. God's spirit is alive within you. His patient love towards you in heart has borne fruit and is beginning to transform you into something more and more glorious. Eventually, you will be a true child of the king, mature, full-grown, perfect. That's where you're going to be. One of the commentators I read put it this way, which I thought was quite cool. Become in act what you are in fact. This idea that there has been a fundamental transformation. You are a child of God. If you've taken Jesus' hand, you are a child of God. Now you need to become in act what you are in fact. Loving your enemies like, like Jesus, loving your enemies like the Father, is taking on the family resemblance. Jesus' closing call here to be perfect or to grow up is that call to become in act what you are in fact, to let that seed sprout up, 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 to let the family resemblance increasingly show through. Does that make sense? You're going to increasingly resemble the king inside his kingdom, increasingly reflect the father inside his family. His character, his values, his ways. And, and it is just that. It's a reflection of who he is. It's a reflection of what he's already done. So with all that in mind, I just want to leave us with the question that Jesus has for us in this text. In verse 47, what are you doing more than others? He asks us, what are you doing more than others? Or the New Living Translation renders it this way. How are you different from anyone else? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even the pagans do that. Now, if you've been with us through this series, think back a few weeks, and you might remember Jesus describes his people as salt, as something that is different. You might remember Jesus describes his people as light, something that can be seen. He calls us to let our good deeds shine before others to the praise and glory of our Father in heaven. Now, if you are no different to the world around you, there's no saltiness to taste. There's no light to see. That's where Jesus' call, his kingdom call, to love our enemies, not just our friends, but our enemies too, comes home. Actually living this out is dramatically different to the world around us. Right, the world around us wants to go 100% the other way. It doesn't turn the other cheek. It whacks you on the other cheek. It doesn't love the enemy. It hates the enemy. And yet God continues to extend sun and rain to all, including his enemies in patient hope. Jesus loves and prays for his enemies in patient hope. And as children of the Father in heaven, we are to grow up, to become in act what we are in fact. That's that's how we are to be different. And this is only possible if this really is your family. This is only possible if your heart really has been transformed. This is the true you, the real you, the true family likeness. I'm going to pray, and then we'll have a moment to respond. Father God, it's hard to um, imagine being able to do this. It just seems way beyond us. And yet we know that this is your heart and your character. That this is 
how you behave towards us. That you loved us while we were still your enemies and you loved us all the way to the end. Please, would you give us that family likeness more and more. Lord, as you transform hearts, please might that transformation work its way out into our lives. And for some of us, Lord, I don't even feel like there are many enemies or opposed or hostile to us. Not clear that this would mean anything, but for others of us, Lord, we face dire enemies. People who really want to damage and destroy and hurt. And I pray particularly for those who know that this challenge is crushing, serious, overwhelming. Lord, please, by your spirit, enlarge their hearts, enlarge our hearts today to be able to love our enemies. Amen. Now, patience has a price, is what we said today loving your enemies, praying for them in hope. But what Jesus is calling for is what Jesus himself delivers. He's not an armchair general sending you to suffer and love while he stays at home with his feet up. He's a God who hurts, a God who bleeds. So we're going to stand and sing together, turning our hearts back to this anchor of our salvation. Let's stand together. Son of God, in all his innocence, you walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. And you are distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sin that you were grace, and the broken you embrace, and in the end, the proof is in your wound. Yes, in the end, the proof is in your wound. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to this heart of suffering. Blood and tears, blood and tears. There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the son of suffering. Your cross, my freedom, your strife, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever, your cross, my freedom, your strength.
can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, pray so on who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Lord of suffering. Hallelujah to the Lord of suffering. One more time, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand over here now for just a brief moment um, while we work on the batteries. Well, thank you, musicians, uh, for leading us in a time of response. Um, and thank you, Matt, for leading us in a chat from uh, Matthew chapter 5. So now we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, as promised, we like to interact. So why don't you turn to your neighbor next to you and spend some moments uh, discussing uh, the talk this morning or even discussing how you'd uh, like to respond to it um, or even some of the questions up on the screen. So take a few minutes, and then after that, uh, we will bring Matt up here to Give a response to all your questions.
Okay, okay. Well, we hope that you've had uh, some good conversations just now. We would encourage you to carry these on after the gathering. I think it's really valuable. Uh, but I've, I've managed to corner Matt and bring him up here, and he's going to give a response to some of these questions. Uh, and there have been some really great questions this morning, and I'm glad that Matt's going to give a response instead of me. Uh, have, how have you loved your... So first question, I can throw this up on the slide. How have you loved your enemies, not wanting you to boast, but just looking to, un- looking to understand what this looks like in practice? Yes, great question. And the truth is, I don't think I've ever experienced a great deal of enmity in my life. I don't think, uh, as far as I've known, that I've really had many particularly hostile enemies to have a chance to demonstrate these sort of responses to. So I think, you know, probably quite a lot of us in the West live reasonably charmed lives. I know I've made enemies sometimes by being really obnoxious and irritating to other people. But I think what I would think about how I have loved my enemies, one thing I have done that has really worked for me is to pray for them. Uh, And hey, that's Jesus's commands, not a genius stroke of insight there, but praying for people I don't like, at least, maybe not my enemies, but people I really don't like, actually has helped me change my attitude towards them somewhat, to come to care for them. The other one I'd point to in this passage, Jesus talks about greeting people in the street. And as I was studying it in the week, I thought that's a very odd, kind of love your enemies. And we know Jesus' example is dying for them on a cross. And the, the, the challenge he gives to us is greet them on the street. And we're like, well, it's a different level. That's kind of basic, loving your enemies, simple stuff. But as I thought about it, if you think about who the enemies were in context, most of Jesus' original audience would have been thinking about the enemies as the Romans. And like we often do with our enemies, they would have turned them into a kind of blanket force, a label, uh, a kind of blob of opposition, the Romans. And one of the things that greeting is, the, the word for greet is a little bit stronger than our kind of, hi, hi. It's, it's friendly exchange between people. It's um, a, a measure of interchange rather than just a quick hello. What it does is it makes them a person to you rather than just a label. And so I wonder if that's another thing that we could do as we think about practically loving our enemies, is trying to think about them as individuals, get to know them as people, rather than to think about our enemies as labels and groups. But that, like, so, so I've actually prayed for people. It has genuinely held my heart towards them. Perhaps getting to know them as individuals would help, but maybe somebody with more experience of enmity would be in a better place to speak. Do you have any enemies you'd speak I, of? I don't have many enemies to speak of, uh, unfortunately, to help in this, but I, I remember chatting. It's, it's a challenge of a positive command. Love your enemies. So you're like, well, how do I do that? But I remember we chatted with Pat leading up to this talk, and he said um, from one of his favorite philosophers, the, to, love your enemy, to love someone is to help them love God. Um, so that is a helpful kind of direction of, uh, how to love your enemies. And then we'll fit in exactly with God's yeah. patient love is love in hope, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, more on that, and I'm sure we can keep talking about that. Uh, next question we have is, when do we stand up to evil or persecution? Yeah, I don't think Jesus in this passage gives us an answer we're looking for. Um, so I, I think Jesus in this passage says, as individuals, We do not. Jesus is our model, and the path he walked was one of loving his enemies all the way to the end and praying for those who persecuted until they killed him. He never stood up to them. So I think that's the model Jesus gives us. Now, does that mean there should be no resistance to evil or persecution in our world? No, I think there's something quite different between individual actions and attitudes and corporate actions and attitudes. Ewan was speaking about this last week. As we think about non-retaliation, as we think about holding off on revenge, we do that in a context where in much of the world there is a state. And uh, the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 13. He tells us that the state, the government, has been given the sword, the sword of justice. And the state has a right place to exercise standing up to evil, standing up to persecution, not turning the other cheek but bringing justice but that kind of responsibility belongs at a corporate level rather than at an individual level so i think individually i think we we are called to suffer in love and hope i guess there is one tweak here so remember god loves in hope and god is wise enough to know when what he is doing will further his hope or not we're not always wise enough to know that but sometimes the best way to help your enemies towards god might be 
to respond to them rather than not to respond, to engage rather than not to engage. The heart of the love command is this hope, right? Is wanting them to know God in the end. So maybe that's the answer for when you stand up to evil or persecution is when you believe or when the Lord has led you to understand that that might help them come closer to God and find their way to salvation because that's the real goal of these commands. So maybe that's one kind of way out, but I realize that's not a brilliant answer for that question. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Matt. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, oh, I think I just clicked away a question that didn't mean to click away. Um, and I did, and now it's gone. I'm sorry, but it was about, it is similar, it is in a similar vein of um, are we not to respond at all to, um, are we not to respond at all to people who wish us harm in the sense of, so it's a similar vein of when do we respond, but are we not supposed to respond as individuals? Yeah, I think, again, I would, I would push that back to um, the idea that there is this uh, authority God has given to states for justice, and that as individuals, we're kind of challenged to behave like Jesus does towards them, loving our enemies. Okay, and I'll take this last one, um, and I'm going to jump down to this one, um, so I feel like it'll help us think about how this works. But this is us becoming more like Jesus, and we talk about this a lot at Hope City. Is that something I do by myself, or does it happen at church? It's something we've been thinking a lot about and talking a lot about. Uh, it's really important to us that um, we make progress in our journeys towards becoming more like Jesus. And yet, how precisely do these things actually happen? What concrete acts contribute and move things forward? It's not always that obvious. So this question kind of says, is it individual? You do it by yourself or corporate? And I think the answer to that is obviously both. Right? There's definitely a me and God. There's definitely a me and scripture, me and the spirit, me and prayer, me and my personal disciplines. And yet there is also uh, God's people one anothering, loving one another, encouraging, exhorting one another, challenging, supporting, caring for one another. Uh, we know that God uses his word as one of the crucial tools for growth. So we would encourage us towards um, Bible reading and towards uh, engaging what scripture has to say. We can do that individually as we read by ourselves. We can do that corporately. We do that in our small groups here as a, a routine part of our practice. So I think it's a, it's a both end. There are lots of ways. And we don't, we don't really know precisely the best way to help us grow. We're thinking about it together. We're happy to learn. We're aspiring to it. We're not going to give up on it and quit. And we do know it's a long journey, uh, a path of a lifetime. The Apostle Paul, towards the close of his life, says he has not arrived. So if you think you have arrived, um, I hate to break it to you, you have not. This is a path of a lifetime. But if you can't see any change, if you can't see any progress, if you take a mark point five years back and you're like, I'm exactly the same me, then you should start scratching your head. Am I becoming more like Jesus, really? And then you should be thinking about how we can do that more with one another. Love to talk more about that. Um, Joe is our point person for this, our director of Become, Becoming More Like Jesus. She is helping us as a church think about this and uh, putting lots of resources to us that we can use, but I guess we have to take hold of them. We have to actually use those resources for there to be any value and power in it. Well, thank you uh, so much, Matt, uh, for your, uh, all your hard work on this and for answering some of these, giving a response to some of these questions. Uh, right before I get you off the stage here, can you give us uh, just the one sentence kind of big point from your chat? Love your enemies towards the hope of their salvation. Amazing. Thank you, Matt.